on Reason Radio. Was America founded on racist principles? This is something I've been hearing from more people on the left recently. Not that America has racism in its past, slavery in its past, obviously. But it's even more than that now. It's, was America founded on racism? Was America founded on racist principles? A lot of people on the left, seems like maybe the New York Times as well, thinks yes. And so we'll go over some history today. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. We are here until 9 p.m. on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Of course, if you ever miss any of the show, you can catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are available. What you want to do as well is like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page, and you can see the live video there as well. A lot of different stuff to get to. And Mr. Tom Benson is here joining me once again. How are you, Tom, on this Friday? I just want you to know that I was not sleeping during history class, so I know it was not founded <laughs> on racism. Okay, I guess I don't have to do the segment now. All it's right, done. See you tomorrow. Over. <laughs> we'll just play some music. This is the elevator music and be done. So, yeah, I'm going to get into that. The other thing I have to get into is this, this Green New Deal. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about buying Greenland, you know, <laughs> not Trump's wanting to buy Greenland. Bernie Sanders has a Green New Deal now. So AOC had a Green New Deal. Now Bernie Sanders has a specific plan. Mm-hmm. And so we'll get mm-hmm. into some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on in the show, you had this business roundtable where some of the top CEOs in the country met and they came out with this new, um, what do you call it, mission statement for businesses in this country. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. I think I've heard this. Yes. Yes. I, I talked about it a little on PM Orlando one day, but I want to delve more into that because it's interesting when you actually look into it and the motivations behind it all. It's, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of socialism in, in this show, unfortunately, that we have to talk about. But I want to get into this whole thing with was America founded on racist principles? Because a lot of this started for a couple of reasons. You know, of course, the Democrats want to use this to win an election. They want to label Trump as a racist. So it goes even deeper than that. And they think they'll get minority votes by saying all this stuff and yada, 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 especially now against Trump. Then you have the New York Times that came out with this 1619 project. 1619 apparently is when we first started importing slaves into North America. You know, I say we, I wasn't there. You, I'm pretty sure you weren't there, Tom Benson. I don't even think my ancestors were there. <laughs> my ancestors came much later than that, at least on my dad's side. So I, you know, when we say we, it wasn't us. None of us were alive back then. But, you know, back then, people that were immigrating to America were bringing slaves. And they're kind of making it seem like this, that was the true founding of this country. And then I heard Beto O'Rourke come out and he did a speech and this is all to be against Trump. This is all after the El Paso shooting, which by the way, I still don't think anyone's actually read the manifesto a couple of weeks ago. I talked about what the El Paso shooters manifesto actually said, and it said a lot of things that would, you could attribute to both sides and nobody wants to mention that, but you know, Beto wants to redo his campaign And he's going to come out and basically say America is racist. In fact, it's a little bit of a long cut here, but I want to play it all. Because Beto came out in a speech and he said this point. He thinks it's going to get him votes. So far, that has yet to be seen. He's still not doing well in the polls. But I I do have to admit, this is a much more interesting Beto than the, oh, I was born to do this, you know, I'm a skateboard and stuff. So I give him credit for that, but I don't don't know if it's going to work. But this is what he said. In this country, though we would like to think otherwise, was founded on racism, has persisted through racism, and is racist today. And if you don't want to accept that phrase or that word or that distinction, look at this. There's ten times the wealth 
in white America today than there is in black America. There are 2.3 million people behind bars tonight while we enjoy our freedom, disproportionately comprised of people of color, the largest prison population on the planet, bar none. In a kindergarten classroom, four- or five-year-old child of color is five times as likely to be disciplined or suspended or expelled as a white child in front of the same teacher for the same infraction in the same country today. But this racism, though foundational, literally kidnapping people from West Africa, bringing them here to build the greatness of this country on their backs and then denying their ancestors the meaningful opportunity to enjoy in the wealth that they had created. For so long, it had flown under the surface, at least for people like me, a white guy from Texas, born every day by those who do not look like me and have had a different experience. But it was only until this administration and this president that that racism was invited out into the open. So we know why he's doing this, right? He said it at the end there. This is to get votes, to do better in the primary, and to make Trump look like a racist. Now he's saying Trump has introduced racism out into the open. Um, I'm pretty sure it was more open back in Jim Crow South than it is today anywhere in America. But they're trying to introduce this narrative. But I don't want to focus too much on the stats of inequality and all that stuff. But you want to talk about when inequality, why there's so much inequality between blacks and whites today. I could go over some big government liberal policies that destroyed black families in the inner cities in this country. So... A lot of times to fix these problems, they want big government programs. And a lot of times those big government programs just make things worse. So we can have that conversation if you want to. For instance, you could just talk about the minimum wage. Blacks, black men were almost equal in making wages to white men until the minimum wage was starting to be put in effect. And then all of a sudden it changed. You want to talk about these big government liberal programs and how they hurt. But they don't want to talk about that. It's just because we're racist. But I want to actually go over what he said there. He said, this country was founded on racism. That was his point. Founded on racism. What proof does he have of that? He has no proof of that. Because it's not true. There's a narrative out there now on the left that this country was put together to protect slavery. That the main reason why we fought against the British was to protect slavery. This obviously is not true. And how do I know this is not true? Because you just have to read history. Did you know that Thomas Jefferson... In the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, put a part in there that talked about how Britain brought slavery to North America and forced it on us and how bad that was. Thomas Jefferson said that in the original draft. Now, they took it out because they didn't want the southern states to go against the revolution. But there's a point right there. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. But he knew when he was writing the Declaration of Independence and he was writing the principles of the Declaration of Independence, he knew that those principles that he was writing in the Declaration of Independence go totally against the idea of slavery. He knew the foundational principles of this country would go totally against slavery. Now, when you talk about the Declaration of Independence, it was actually written by Thomas Jefferson, but there was a committee put together. That committee was put together by... Um, the Continental Congress, it had Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. John Adams was always against slavery. Oh, he, he didn't own slaves. John Adams thought it was an evil institution and didn't own slaves. Yet John Adams was one of the most instrumental founding fathers that pushed for independence against Britain. So I'm supposed to believe that someone who was against slavery who didn't own slaves, pushed for independence to protect slavery? That makes no sense. 
Now, Benjamin Franklin did own slaves when he was younger. But did you know later in his life, Benjamin Franklin founded an abolition society? Because he knew slavery was evil. You have three people right there that I talked about in the founding of this country who understood that slavery was evil and understood that that when they were putting together this first the Declaration of Independence and later the Constitution in 1787, they knew it could not coexist with slavery. In fact, in the Constitutional Convention, there were several times where it almost was just disbanded and the Constitution was never made because of the issue of slavery, because there was such a division between especially the northern states and the southern states on that issue. My point is there's never been an agreement in this country of slavery being a good thing. It was a divisive issue from the beginning. And slavery was outlawed in most of the northern states way before the a lot of the southern states. So this has been a divisive issue. And there were a lot of people, even those who owned slaves, who were against it from the beginning because they knew it was against the principles of freedom. Elbridge Jerry was another one. Didn't sign the Declaration. He would not sign the Constitution because it didn't include a Bill of Rights. He was against slavery. Now, James Madison, who's considered the father of the Constitution, he did own slaves. He was from Virginia. But did you know that when the Revolutionary War was going on, there were some who uh, who proposed an idea that um, in order to get people to sign up for the Continental Army under Washington, um, they would be able to... Let me have it here. I got the the books here, they would be able to um, kind of uh, get a slave in return for it, basically. And, like, Madison was against that, and this is what he said. He understood that slavery was a moral issue when the Virginia Assembly had proposed encouraging enlistments by granting each enlistee a slave, he objected. This is why he objected. Would it not be as well to liberate and make soldiers at once of the blacks themselves to make them instruments for enlisting white soldiers? It would certainly be more consonant to the principles of liberty, which ought never to be lost of in a contest for liberty. Basically, making the point that what they really should do if they're going to do something like this is blacks who enlisted for the army would be freed. And the reason why he said that, he says it right here, because that was more in line for what they were fighting for. He understood, Madison, at the time, during the revolution, that they were fighting for freedom and liberty. And he understood that those principles go directly against slavery that those principles could not coexist. And a better plan would be to set the slaves free who enlisted into the army because that aligned more with the principles of the founding of this country. Example after example, I can give you of how at the founding of this country, they understood that slavery was not going to be able to last forever in a country that was built upon individual liberty. Now, another thing, by the way, Madison was one of the founders of the American Colonization Society. The American Colonization Society back then was the idea that they would free all the slaves and uh, let them go back to Africa, relocate them back to Africa. Now, today, that would be seen as racist because why would you want to relocate them? But back then, it was slave owners who were against that because they didn't want to set the slaves free. Now, one of the reasons it had its critics, the American Colonization Society, is abolitionists thought it was a futile project whose only effect would be to rid America of free blacks. But some slave owners thought it put dangerous dreams of freedom in black minds. So they were saying basically that back then, when they were talking about colonizing blacks back to Africa, They were afraid too many blacks were going to say, oh, you mean we could have an idea of maybe being free one day? And there would be against, there would be revolts and they'd be against slavery even more. Henry Clay, who was one of the early speakers of the House, and he was a Whig uh, back in this country. This is what he said in response to that. 
He said, what would they who reproach us for stirring up blacks have done? If they would repress all tendencies towards liberty, they must do more than put down the benevolent efforts of this society. They must go back to the era of our liberty and independence and muzzle the cannon, cannon which thunders its annual joyous return. They must blow out the moral lights around us and extinguish that great torch of all which America presents to a benighted world, pointing the way to their rights, their liberties, and their happiness. And when they have achieved all those purposes, their work will be yet com incomplete. They must penetrate the human soul and eradicate the light of reason and the love of liberty. Then and not till then can you perpetuate slavery. His point there was to get the idea of freedom out of the minds of enslaved blacks at the time, you would have to go back and go against the foundations of America because the foundations of America of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the foundations of America of individual liberty and the bill of rights. Once those were put in place in this country, there is no way that that could coexist with slavery forever. And there was no way that blacks would not see that and say, and not understand, oh, you mean we can't be free sometime? They were inspired by the words of our founders, eventually towards freedom. There's a reason why abolitionists in the history of this country constantly quoted the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. Because even though the founders who wrote those things were flawed men themselves, and some of them had slaves, even they struggled with it because they knew owning slaves went against the principles of the of this country, the founding principles of this country, and there's no way it could coexist forever. So this idea that this country was founded on racist principles, well, is just beyond reason. And yet I see it all the time, people on the left saying that. I'm going to talk more about this. We have much more to get to on the show as well, you can text the show to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you miss any of the show, you can download the Beyond Reason podcast on iTunes. The voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason is back now. Welcome back to the show. Don't worry, we are going to get into some current politics. I have to go over the fact that Bernie Sanders has a new Green New Deal that would only cost him $16 trillion. Oh, just nothing, just a drop in the bucket. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll get into that in just a moment. But I want I want to, I started the show, and if you missed any of it, you can catch the podcast later, anywhere podcasts are available. I started the show talking about how a lot of people on the left and a lot of the Democrats are pushing forward this narrative now that America was founded on racism and racist principles. And I just went over the history about how many of the founders, even those founders who owned slaves, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, and others, they owned slaves, but they struggled with it later in life. And they talked about it and they feared a civil war out of this. And they knew that it was probably going to happen if something wasn't done about it because it could not coexist with a country founded on liberty. They knew it, and they warned about it. That proves the opposite. That proves that even though they were flawed men who didn't see a way out of slavery at the time without breaking up the union or causing major problems, they were still flawed men who did a wrong thing, they still understand that the principles of the founding were good and about freedom. And that's something that's not focused on. Now, why, why is Beto doing this? And why, why are Democrats and the left doing this? Well, it's insidious. And the reason is because they, they want to remake the country, basically. They want to change the foundations of this country. If you can get enough people to hate the Constitution because you convince them that it was based on racist principles, then it's much easier to change it or go against it in the long run. Because... Well, you know, you say that's unconstitutional. Who cares if it's unconstitutional? The Constitution is racist anyway. See where this is going? It's dangerous because the whole reason why they're doing it is to rip this country out of its foundations, to remake it under, I don't know, some kind of socialist utopia for a lot of them, I guess. 
So they want to convince you the Constitution was racist. So we talked about slavery, and I had mentioned that there's a reason why abolitionists, for years, in their abolitionist newspapers before slavery was abolished, they would quote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution because they knew the principles in those two documents couldn't coexist with slavery. Well, the same can be true about the Civil Rights Movement. So no doubt blacks, especially in the South, had a really hard time in this country even after even after slavery was abolished. I'm not denying the history. You know, a book that I would highly recommend that you read is The Warmth of Other Suns. That book is about the great migration of blacks from the South to the North because the Jim Crow South was so bad and blacks were moving to the North to get away from the racism. Unfortunately, they faced some racism in the North as well. That's true. It's history. I'm not negating that. But I'm just pointing out that we're talking about foundational principles now. The Democrats are going against foundational principles now, and that's different. But civil rights leaders also would quote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution all the time to promote civil rights. In fact, Martin Luther King did that very thing during the I Have a Dream speech. Here's what he said. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was Martin Luther King Jr. in the I Have a Dream speech. What did he say there? He said, well, first he said that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were magnificent, magnificent documents. Did you hear him say that? That's what he said. Well, I thought they were racist. I thought it was bound, founded on racism. Well, he didn't think so. He thought they were promissory notes for the future that included blacks and whites, and that the principles in them were to establish freedom for everyone. And he admitted after that that it wasn't happening in the country at the time, but he pointed to those documents as beacons of light and hope for the future because of the principles in them. If Martin Luther King Jr. has every right to be upset at the country at the time because they treated blacks poorly, especially in the Jim Crow South, he could have been upset, but he, even he went back to that and said, no, the foundations of this country are good. We just need to live up to them more. That's the right way to go about it. But instead, what I'm hearing now is rip the foundations because the foundations themselves are racist. Before we go to break, I just want to recommend a book I just started reading. I know one of these books, um, but it's, a, it's called Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln by Richard Brookshire. Um, Brookheiser, I'm sorry, Richard Brookheiser, um, great book, talks about Lincoln, how he was inspired by the founders, and his inspiration by the founders is why is he would use words of the founders and the founding documents to go to prove that slavery was wrong, even back then. Now, he didn't want to totally abolish it until the Civil War already happened because he wanted to preserve the Union, but he said slavery can't coexist because a slave is a man and men have rights. And that was said under the Declaration of Independence. Don't fall into the trap that we're founded, that we were founded on racism, because it's not true. It's just not true. Doesn't mean racism didn't exist. Doesn't mean slavery didn't exist. Doesn't mean we should ignore the bad parts of our history. We can't ignore them. We need to learn from them. But we're going too far with this. And it's not good. And the reason why is to destroy the Constitution. That's why. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you heart Beyond Reason Radio, listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. This is Orlando's Smart Talk Radio. Beyond Reason Radio continues now. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yevy, Voice of Reason, 
in a world that is beyond reason. We're on until 9 p.m. tonight right here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at PMOWFLA. Follow me on Twitter at PMOWFLA. Or you can like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. So Bernie Sanders has a new plan out. The Green New Deal. I thought we already went through this. <laughs> I thought we did this with AOZ already and they didn't even want to vote on it. But he has a new plan out. He unveiled it yesterday. It only cost $16.3 trillion. His plan calls for the United States to eliminate fossil fuel use by 2050. It declares climate change a national emergency, envisions building new solar and wind geothermal power sources across the country, and commits $200 billion to help poor nations cope with climate change. So it's about spending a lot of money, but it's actually a lot more than that. But here's Bernie Sanders talking about his new proposal. It is no secret that we must transition away from fossil fuel, period, end of discussion. There ain't no middle ground here. There ain't no middle ground here. But there's something else he said that's very interesting. He was on MSNBC earlier this week, and he was asked about, you know, a certain part of this this plan has to deal with energy. Listen to what he says here. It's amazing. Here it is. You talk about there's public, there's some federal public administration of power in this country based on the Tennessee right. Valley Authority and others. Right. Right. And right. basically you, you propose essentially a federal takeover of the whole thing. That essentially a Tennessee Valley Authority extension for the whole country. Right? Am I getting my understanding that yeah, correctly? Yeah, that's, you're in the ballpark. That's right. Look, the TVA has done a lot of good work. Uh, it produces electricity from hydropower uh, and other sources. What we need to do is have an aggressive federal government saying that we are going to produce a massive amount of, from solar and from wind and from other sustainable energies, and we will sell it out. And by the way, we're going to make money doing that. But you can't you nibble around the edges anymore. We need to transform right. our energy so, system. That means a massive increase in sustainable energy. So, so, I so what did he say there? He basically has called for totally taking over the energy industry in this country. Mm. And he says it. He admits it freely. Look, the, the reason is there's no middle ground here, Tom Benson. There, there's, there's no middle ground. It's, it's such a natural disaster that we have to do something. And it's like World War II. Now, if you know anything about World War II, the government basically took over a lot of the country, actually, although it didn't, they needed the help of a lot of private industry oh, to get sure. through it. Sure. And actually an unleashed private industry before that. But this is always the excuse. This is a war now. And we need total fundamental structural change where you'll have the government basically taking over a lot of the industry in this country. This is my biggest problem with climate change in this whole debate on climate change in this country. The biggest problem I have is when Al Gore really made this a big thing when he came out with his movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, it is an inconvenient truth. But isn't it amazing how convenient this truth is for socialists? Isn't it amazing how convenient this so-called truth is for big government Democrats? Isn't it amazing how convenient this truth is for those who are against big business in this country or lower taxes or expansion of industry or whatever you want it? It's really convenient for Al Gore, is it not? This so-called inconvenient truth? What it's inconvenient for is capitalism. It's convenient for socialism, but inconvenient for capitalism, inconvenient for American expansion, inconvenient for prosperity. Amazing how that works. That is what has always bothered me about all of this. 
because it's not inconvenient for socialism. It has been the greatest excuse for government expansion and basically socialism. Now, if you listen to Bernie Sanders or you listen to AOC, than anything I've ever seen in this country's history. And I'm supposed to believe that it's such a crisis and that we should get rid of our capitalist economy or get rid of our rights because it's such a crisis and you can't let a crisis go to waste. No, that's why I don't buy it. Because it's just an excuse a lot of times for these big government Democrats to expand their control. It's just an excuse for big government Democrats to um, to expand government, to bring on socialism, because it's, quote unquote, an emergency. And you know how I know they're really not serious about this? A part of Bernie Sanders' plan is a moratorium on nuclear power plant license renewal, renewals. Why? Why is that a part of your Green New Deal plan? One of the best ways to get rid of carbon emissions in this country or in the world right now would be to switch to nuclear power. Because nuclear power really doesn't have any carbon emissions. Yet a part of your plan is to get rid of nuclear power. What? How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. That's the problem. If you're if you really think this is such a crisis to the point that we have to restructure the entire economy, get rid of capitalism as we know it, take over the energy sector and take over all these industries, wouldn't you think it's such a crisis that we need nuclear power as well? And then we had this case in Florida recently where they were converting a coal plant, part of a coal plant, for natural gas. Natural gas uses 60% or spews 60% less carbon than coal. You think the environmentalists would have been celebrating this fact. Imagine if more coal-fired power plants were converting to natural gas, how much that would help us in terms of this goal of getting rid of carbon emissions. And yet they complained about it. And yet they tried to shut it down. And yet they hated it. And I'm supposed to take them seriously now that we have to do all these things they want? And then you have the likes of like Al Gore, who says this is such a crisis and we can't wait to do something about it. Yet he lives in a multi-million dollar mansion with all of these homes, uses all kinds of energy, travels the world on a private jet, eats a lot of meat. You're not supposed to eat meat anymore. <laughs> if you're eat meat, I know, right? That's like the worst thing now. And it's like, oh, well, I, I'm rich enough. What he'll say is, well, I buy carbon credits. I'm rich enough to plant oh, trees to make up for it. Please. And that's what I'm saying. Again. Amazing how convenient this whole thing has been for Al Gore who's made a ton of money off of it, got an Academy Award for his movie, and didn't have to change his lifestyle really at all because he can just buy carbon credits and feel good about himself. Oh, well, that's convenient. While the rest of us have to totally transform our lives, stop eating meat, get rid of capitalism, and, you know, well, yeah, but that's the inconvenient truth here. Oh, okay, thanks. Why don't you just buy more carbon credits for the rest of us and we can just solve this problem? This is the biggest problem I've had with it forever. It is such a convenient excuse for big government progressives to expand government control. And now they're not even being, you know, uh, sneaky about it. They're just coming out and saying we need to take over the energy industry. It's such an emergency. It's such a crisis. We basically we need totally government takeover. We need higher taxes. We need to get rid of nuclear power. We need uh, this organization. That only we need to spend $16 trillion. And, you know, oh, okay, well, yeah, it is an emergency. Unbelievable. This is beyond, well, it is beyond reason. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. It would be beyond reason not to listen to Yaffe on your TuneIn Radio app. Download the app today and search Beyond Reason Radio. conscience in your ear telling you the difference between right and wrong yaffe is back on the air welcome back to the show everyone this is beyond reason radio i'm your host michael yaffe your voice of truth 
the conscience of WFLA, as Carl Jackson has uh, called me before. I appreciate y'all listening to the show. If you ever miss any of the show, you can catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are available. Uh, we were talking in the last segment about, um, you know, Bernie Sanders and how he wants this Green New Deal and all of that. And it's going to cost $16 trillion. You know, you have Bernie Sanders has been out there a lot saying corporations are bad. They make too much money, too much profit, at the expense of the working man, yada, yada, yada. And then Elizabeth Warren is the same thing, saying the same stuff. Most of the Democrats are saying all the same stuff. And the message is... Companies care too much about profits, not about people, and blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, Bernie used to complain about millionaires and billionaires Mm -hmm. until he became a millionaire. Now it's just billionaires. (laughs) Have you noticed that? Uh, That's actually, I have not noticed that, but I I could. Well, you know, he was asked about that. You know what he said in response? No. Well, I made it the right way. Oh, I made it the good way. I see. You see, the, 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 the CEOs, they made it an evil way. They made it off the backs. Of workers who are struggling in this country. Yeah, okay. Um, So, as a response to all of this, though, there was this business roundtable that happened earlier this week where 181 of the nation's top CEOs agreed that driving shareholder value is no longer their sole business objective. They expanded their mission beyond mere wealth creation to include everything from taking care of employees to helping their communities. The shift, spearheaded by the chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase, CEO Jamie Dimon, reflects the growing pressure from employees, social media, and customers to do more than increase stock prices. The big picture, it says here, I'm reading from Axios, says, Truth is, even the most press shy introverted CEOs need to be de facto politicians. Thanks to several unambiguous social trends, millennial employees demand their employers stand for something beyond profit. Can I, can I just tell you something? I hate, this is just a really pet peeve of mine. I was talking about a friend, I was talking with a friend about this recently. I get so annoyed at these companies Mm -hmm. that have all these social justice stuff on the side, you know, Mm. you know, you you go to an NBA game, NBA cares, look what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. And the reason why this annoys me is because you have, It's appeasement is what it is. Yeah. Well, I was try- I was trying to make the point that now we have to choose where we go to shop based on what where they stand politically mm-hmm. or what cause they support or whatever. Mm-hmm. I would much rather live in a world where I just go to shop based on the product or service they provide for they provide for me and what the value is. Like why do I have to think about what, you know, Jamie Dimon, what Chase does to help people in Africa. So, you know, I don't know. It could be anything that they support. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be better if those companies, we talk about taking care of employees, <laughs> wouldn't it be better if those companies took the extra profits they had and reinvested it in their business instead of doing all this other stuff with this, all these social justice programs? So now we have to choose where we go based on where a company stands on this issue or that issue. What are they doing for this or that? And I'm thinking, but when they're doing that stuff, that extra stuff, they're taking away money that could be reinvested into into the business to expand the business, which would expand employee employee benefits or employee salaries or or or, right exactly pay more to your slave workers, (laughs) you know. (laughs) And that's something I'm like. I I don't want to give you my money because you have help with some charity. I want to give you my money because I, you, I it's a trade. I want you to give me what a product or service that you're offering me. But because we're so obsessed with PR about all this stuff now, we companies have to do all this other stuff. And I'm thinking that used to be the job of churches and individuals. In private organizations and all of that, but now now we expect businesses to do this. Corporate citizenship. But it's not the role of a business to do these things. Now, individuals that work for a business or own a business can do these things. That's fine. But the business itself, I don't want you to do that. I want you to give me a product or service at a good value. That's why I go there. I, I know it's just a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because I, it just gets annoying. Like, 
oh, like when the NBA, you go to an NBA, ah, oh, the NBA cares. It's like, oh, you know, I wasn't going to go to this game now, but now you built a playground and now, oh, now I'm here. Like, I, I just, I don't know. I just, I just don't get it. I, I know people are going to think I'm crass for saying that. Because I'm not against charities. I'm not against helping the community. I'm not against these things. I just don't know why we expect our businesses to do it. I just, I don't, I, I know. I know this will, ne- it will never change. It'll never happen. But I'm just pointing that out. But when it comes to these CEOs wanting to change their business model and they don't want to focus on profits anymore. The biggest problem I had with this is the two are not mutually exclusive. So they're basically buying into the premise by the left and the Democrats that the reason why they're basically buying into the premise that they're making a profit at the expense of something else. So when a business makes a profit, they're saying, oh, well, they're making their profit at the expense of the employees or at the expense of the community or at the expense of the environment or something like that. That's the premise by the left. When actually most companies, they're making a profit because they provide a good or service at a value at a price people are willing to pay for, and it's a good or service that they want. That's what they're doing. But the Democrats have been pushing forward this lie that profits are bad. Too much profit is bad. You don't, a company doesn't need that much profits. And I'm like, well, you're going to take their money and spend it better? Okay. <laughs> I don't buy that. <laughs> but it's not like, and they make it seem like the companies just hoard this money and they have big vaults of gold coins like Scrooge McDuck. And they, and they, they, the CEOs at night go jump in their vaults of gold coins (laughs) and with their evil profit money while their slave workers are, you know, breaking their backs. But that's not true. Most of the profits is traded in the stock market. There's investments that go on. And if they make more profits, guess who benefits? Not only the big time shareholders, but a lot of those mutual funds or these small time shareholders that have 401ks invested in these stocks or when they make profits, a lot of times they invest that profit back into the company. The company expands, the company hires more employees. They become more productive in the long run. So not only do consumers benefit because they get the, they get what they want at a lower price, but the employees benefit because the business has expanded. And the economy benefits us all, all because of profits. But they make it seem like if they go down this road of, oh, well, we don't really care about profits that much anymore. They're going to appease the Democrats. Here's a little, here's a little word of advice to these companies. Bernie Sanders is not going to be, is not going to stop being a socialist because you changed your mission statement. Elizabeth Warren is not going to stop asking for higher taxes because you changed your mission statement. You're basically just buying into their premise now. Profits are not a bad thing because profits go back into the economy, either through the business or in the stock market, or they're spent in an economy. When a business does well in a community and makes a profit, it usually helps the community because that money is reinvested back into the community. And people say, oh, but then the businesses go too far. Sometimes businesses do go too far. And you know what happens? It's called competition. Another business comes in and does a better job and competes. But you can make a profit while also taking take care of your employees. A lot of companies take care of their employees because it helps their business model overall. And it helps them make more of a profit. See how that works? If a company is doing well and they're doing well because of their employees, they're going to want to pay their employees more because in a good job market, they're going to, those employees could go somewhere else. But the business, a smart CEO is going to know that those employees are what help make the business so profitable in the first place. And they're going to hire them. See how economics works, but it's all based on this false premise that profits are bad, that companies are greedy, that they don't care about their workers. They don't care. Look, profits are good. It's what's created the most prosperous society in the history of mankind. And yet we're trying to undermine it constantly. It really just annoys me.
All right, I appreciate you listening to the show. This show went by uh, really fast today. I don't know how that happened. But if you miss any of the show, you can catch the podcast anywhere that podcasts are available. And uh, make sure to like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page as well. I am Michael Yeffy. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff, and I'll catch you guys next time.